Uh, it is such a pleasure to have twice in one day to sit next to David Ferriero. For those who uh, have not followed his entire career, having been director of at MIT and at Duke and at the, as the Mellon director of the New York Public Library, um, and now leading our archives, I think we as Americans are incredibly lucky and proud to have you doing this. Um, from the start of the DPLA, David Ferriero was the number one supporter of this project and hosted us in the archives. And um, all the way along, I just have been so uh, so impressed and grateful. Um, thank you, David Ferriero for doing what you do as our archivist. Congratulations. So I really do need to, to, um, to do that because um, I, I want to frame my, my comments uh, around what John is, is demanding of us all in this new book um, about creating a new nostalgia um, to replace you know, the way we used to do, do our work. Um, the reason I jumped up, if anyone saw me jump up and run to the back of the room, is I had to catch Micah before he left to remind him of a conversation that we had six years ago about, should I go to library school? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> um, so let me, um, just in no particular order, talk about, the, the, especially that last session, about my own passion for creating my, my deep feeling that these institutions, and I'm talking about libraries, archives, and museums are villages that require a certain set of competencies and the credential for, in my um, humble opinion, isn't coming from the professional programs. There are pockets of ex excellence that I can point to where there is some good work going on but we train librarians and we train archivists and we train museum professionals and there's no commingling, there's no looking at the best practices in each one of those um, programs to, to create the kind of program that I require as, a, as a, an employer. Um, because each one of these jobs in each, in each one of these institutions requires the best of libraries, the best of archives, and the best of museum um, practice. For me, even more disturbing is the recruitment process for these programs. I don't think they're rigorous. Um, I don't think that the right questions are being asked. I don't think that you can expect to turn out folks who um, are gonna thrive in this environment unless you do a good job of screening at, at the very beginning. Uh, John, this morning in our conversation talking about the book, um, I was pushing him on because he doesn't in the book talk about, okay, so you, you, you make this uh, case for a new nostalgia, but you, you kind of walk away from, so who's going to staff it and how are we gonna train the people to do that? And he talked about the recruitment process at his institution, the, his high school, where the motto of the school, where is John? John, what is the motto of the school? The Latin? Not for self. Not for self, which gets translated into be nice. Um, which, I, which resonated with me because in each of these institutions, what we want are people who can be nice, people who can work with each other, but more, more importantly, work with the clientele um, to, to engage, inform, and uh, entertain. Another phrase from, um, John, in John's language, um, the community dealing with either the library, the museum, or the, the, um, the archive. So um, I was particularly struck by Mike's um, comments about um, the administrative readiness for this vision and the problems with the culture in some of our institutions, that this is threatening, that this um, uh, risk-taking focus on the unknown, creating the future on the fly is very threatening. Um, uh, traditional, I'm, I'm counting myself among them, traditional administrators um, are used to plans that kind of lay out what the next five years, I remember when I was at Duke being saddled with a 
uh, a committee to look at academic computing for the next 25 years. <laughs> 25 years. Um, but we're trained as, as administrators to be you know, prescriptive about a path for um, a specified period of time, usually five years. And so the, the um, requirements of this, this vision of, of being much more opportunistic, much more nimble, requires a very different set of mind, a very different mindset on the part of the administrator. And it's not going to be successful until that mindset exists. Um, you can, I, I can, let me just share a story about my first days at the National Archives. Um, uh, so I started in November of 2009. Uh, within the first um, couple of months I heard that there was a group meeting basically in secret um, at, the, at the archives, um, a group of staff interested in social media. And they weren't authorized to meet as a group. Um, so I heard about this, found out about their schedule, and walked into one of their meetings. And it was like, oh my god, we're busted, you know. <laughs> But it was, it was one of the best meetings I ever had um, in terms of the ideas that folks had and, and um, things, vision, their vision of the future. And it also gave me a, a sense of just how this problem of um, restricting the creativity, the innovation, the um, excitement um, uh, of, the, of the staff at large. So we... Uh, this is how long ago it was. We decided they were very interested in iPads and iPhones, and um, so we, I said, let's get 25 of each and fool around with them and experiment. And, well, the next morning I got a call from the CIO saying, you know, we don't support iPhones and iPads. And then I heard from the acquisitions department, you know, I understand you want iPhones and iPads. Well, that will be about 13 months to get them in. And, <laughs> And I'm like, you know, 13 months, that's like two generations. Um, so the culture thing is real and it's huge. And it's not just the top, Mike. It exists within the organization, too, of folks who have been around for a while and feel that the, the innovative um, folks are getting all the, the uh, attention. Uh, and that we've lost our, you know, kind of vision of the importance of the traditional roles. So it's very important uh, from the management side, the administrative side, the leadership side, to value, to pay as much attention to the, those f innovators, those creative staff, as, you, uh, as to the, the, the folks who have been around for a while, um, as you do to the, the newer innovative staff, which, which leads me to question what kind of opportunities are we doing for con continuing education, professional development, whatever you call it, that bring those people along, that values their contribution and then moves them into this new world where they're actually engaged and excited about, about the work. And are there, is it possible for the schools, the professional programs, or the professional societies, or communities of practitioners to provide uh, professional development for, for those folks? Or is this something that, there, that, that could be contracted out, that there are, is an, it's a new industry? Um, so that's um, a thought that I had. So I was very interested in Kim's asking the audience about skill set because one of the things that really gets me is that in my hundred years in the profession, <laughs> it wasn't until I went to a session in January at Simmons where anyone from a library school or an archival program or a museum program ever asked me what I was looking for. So if you're, it gave me, it, it has given me for some time pause to think that, that how do these schools create curriculum if they're not talking to the customer? And when I challenged this at this meeting, I was told, well, the students are, are the customer. And I said, 
garbage. <laughs> I'm the customer. I'm the one who's buying your product. Why don't you ask me what I'm looking for in terms of, of competencies? So I think we have a lot. So Kim, thank you for you know, opening that door. And I think we have a lot of work to do to, um, to work with the, the existing programs um, to, to get them to the point where we want them to be. Um, let me see. Be nice. What does it mean to be a professional? Oh, um, really resonated with uh, passion projects, the 20% of the time, that that's something across the board that, that we're trying to instill now in the National Archives. With a, we have a new innovation program, Innovation Hub, um, where staff from all across the country can um, bring either physically or virtually issues, problems that they want to work on and trying to figure out ways that we can free up 20% uh, of people's time to, on a regular basis to work on passion projects. So, um, I guess that's it. I um, encourage you to um, buy John's book and, <laughs> and to buy multiple copies because the audience for this book, as important as it is for you to read it, it's more important for administrators, trustees, and the folks who are making decisions about your budgets to read this book because it paints um, a very optimistic future of what's possible, but it's not gonna work unless we get the support that we need to do it. So thank you, John, for writing this book. Thanks. today. Thank you so much, David. That was really um, wonderful, and we appreciate you coming here. We know how busy you are. And in closing, I really just want to thank each and every one of you for coming and sharing. These are hard work, these meetings. You know, we come, and it's very dense. There's a lot of information here. There's a lot that you share that helps us. We're going to take it all and go back. I don't know if you know this, but Ricky Irway and Christy Hill over here have been absorbing everything and they are going to produce a paper summarizing this meeting, you know, pulling it all together. Last year we just published notes. We thought we'd improve upon that, so we're really looking forward to that. That'll be out in about a month. I'm looking at them, a month? Ish? And, uh, but in the meantime, we'll have the archive video on the website. We'll, we will have the, uh, the raw transcript, so if you want to look for anything in there, you'll be able to do that. We're going to pour over it. And as I said at the beginning of the day, you really help us do our jobs. You know, we rely on your expertise for everything we do, when we make our awards, when we have you in for panels and we really rely on you to help us every year as we think about these shared priorities, so thank you. Um, before I leave, there's just a couple of other people that I would like to thank. And you know how, you know, a meeting of this size is a big thing to pull off. So we thanked those who put the program together already. But I wanna take a moment to thank Katie Murray, Katie who's hiding over there behind the pillar. Katie, you know, runs the Office of Library Services, really, at the Institute of Museum and Library Services and coordinated every aspect of this, and many of you know her, so can we just give her a big <laughs> round of applause? Thank you, Karen. And also Capital Meeting Planning, Margaret. Is she over there? She's there. Thank you so, so much, and that's all I have for now. Um, we look forward to keeping the conversation going. And please keep tweeting on IMLS Focus if things come to you. Look for our guidelines. We will, put, we will publish guidelines this summer, June or July, that will draw from what we've spoken about today. We have those two grant deadlines, September and February, so we're having a lot more um, flexibility in our cycle, but we really, you know, we really look to you to help us uh, move the ball down the field. So thank you so much. <laughs>